You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It's Thursday, October 17th, 2019. I'm Michael Brooks on a Michael Thursday. This is the five time award winning. Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Princeton historian Matt Carp on his brilliant new Jacobin essay on 2020, most important piece of the election so far. Is this the future liberals want? We'll be talking about that and the history of of the modern Democratic Party. Erdogan continues with his vicious incursion in Kurdish areas in northern Syria, even as the Kurds valiantly fight back, teaming up with Assad. Apparently, Donald Trump's brilliant and persuasive letter did not do much. Ecuador... Agreement is reached between the social movements and right-wing President Lenin Moreno on fuel subsidies, the new IMF World Bank austerity packages. Talk about that. The European Union announces a new Brexit deal with the UK. Trump's meltdown with Pelosi apparently started with her making a Putin joke. And... Everybody just plays their role. Ugh. Apparently Pelosi's getting a lot of wins. Ex-Pompeo advisor tells impeachment investigators he was disturbed by attempts to use foreigners to hurt Trump's political opponents. Gordon Sundlin, Trump envoy and key figure in impeachment probe facing criticisms over a $1 million taxpayer-funded home renovation. <laughs> That's the spirit of this administration. McConnell eyes a quick impeachment trial in the Senate. CBS strike is officially on as the Chicago Teachers Union and the mayor fail to reach a last minute deal. Solidarity. Past three months in Afghanistan have been the deadliest on civilians in a decade. Time to get out. And... Congressman Elijah Cummings passed. He was 68 years old. Uh, Really, I think admired by all, regardless of where he were, is clearly a very good person and effective legislator. Joe Biden is bleeding cash, but not hurting for private jet rides. (laughs) Talk about that. Amazon dumps one million into Seattle's elections to fight a basic human agenda. Elizabeth Warren in a major mistake on the basics of Middle East politics, revealing more concerns in her foreign policy, even as it's reported that part of the reason for Ilan Ilan Omar's endorsement of Bernie Sanders is because of her concern about war and occupation. All that and much, much more on today's Majority Report. Um, All right, folks. So, in Turkey, in northern Syria, uh, things are still, you know, taking place. It's a very fluid situation. The bottom line, um, Turkey has been using uh, far-right groups, uh, suicide bombers, terrorist groups, and their operations. There's no doubt that, as Mark Ames pointed out, that there are some people in the in the mainstream of foreign policy making who were excusing groups like this before when they were fighting Assad, uh, and who are now all of a sudden correctly identifying them as, as terrorist organizations uh, as Turkey deploys them uh, in their attempt to ethnically cleanse the Kurds in northern Syria. Um, and then, of course, there's other people that uh, want to ignore uh, Assad's crimes against humanity. Uh, uh, as well as as so many people just continue to get Syria wrong. Um, It's a horrifying, disturbing situation. There is resiliency in the Rojava fighting forces, however. Uh, And then, as always, everything overlaps with the grotesque comedy 
of the Trump administration. And, uh, you know, just is what it is. So we're going to laugh at this because this letter that Trump sent to uh, President Erdogan on October 9th is, I mean, beyond laughable. It's hysterical. It's bizarre. What's incredible is that probably a lot of people in the Trump cult will actually think that this was effective and, and smart. So uh, this letter is utterly demented, and the only way to present it is in a professional reading by the finest Trump impersonator on the planet, Anthony... Atmanyuk. Ant, 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 we're, we sound like him impersonating Trump when we say his last name. Antimanic. Anyways, he used to do the Trump show on Comedy Central, which was hilarious. There should have been a second season. This is him on Twitter reading Donald Trump's October 9th letter to Tayyip Erdogan. The White House, Washington, October 9th, 2019. Whoa, jinx. His Excellency Recep Tayyip Erdogan, President of the Republic of Turkey. Anakin... Dear Mr. President, let's work out a good deal. You don't want to be responsible for slaughtering thousands of people, and I don't want to be responsible for destroying the Turkish economy. And I will. I've already given you a little sample with respect to Pastor Brunson. I have worked hard to solve some of your problems. Don't let the world down. You can make a great deal. General Mazzaluam is willing to negotiate with you, and he is willing to make concessions that they would never have made in the past. I am confidentially conclosing a copy of his letter to me, just received. <laughs> History will look upon you favorably if you get this done the right and humane way. It will look upon you forever as the devil if good things don't happen. Don't be a tough guy. Don't be a fool. I'll call you later. Sincerely, Donald Jumble Company. <laughs> Oh, my God. Jesus Christ, that guy captures the absolute essence of this asshole. Um, now, Donald Trump betrayed the Kurds, which, by the way, multiple Republicans have. Going back to Henry Kissinger in the 1970s and George H.W. Bush in the early 1990s. And when Trump uh, betrays people or when Trump gets rolled by someone else, he blames and is a whiny little scumbag. Here he is, clip number two. No? Oh, I just wanted to point out that yeah, that, that letter was real. Some people aren't... Oh, no, that's a that. real that's letter. A, that's a real letter. That yeah. is not satire, folks. That is a 100% real letter. That was Donald Trump's brilliant mind and diplomacy in action. Here Which he the is. The Turks then threw in the trash, literally. <laughs> No, the Turks, first of all, they, they probably had to figure out, like, like, all right, what's the best way to translate this? It makes doesn't make any sense. And then they probably sat yeah, they around. They fired three translators. They fired three they... translators. <laughs> they go, then, that is what it says. Then they laughed uh, and enjoyed themselves. All right, here is Donald Trump blaming the Kurds. Now, again, the Kurds are a historically repressed group by multiple countries, including, of course, Turkey and the Middle East. Even and in addition to you know some incredibly successful innovative politics in Rojava, if you were even just going to take it from a you know the supposedly this U.S. centric perspective, which by the way, of course, this action is is freeing ISIS people and empowering those groups. So Donald Trump is also uh, this is in fact a huge threat to global security. How he's done this, but if you were to take that narrow view. You know, of like, I don't care anything else. I just care about how they fight it, ISIS, fought ISIS. No one has fought ISIS more effectively than uh, the Kurds in northern Syria. By the way, Turkish government was meeting with forces from the YPG up until 2015. So when they lie and say that they're exactly the same thing as the PKK, they're lying. Here is Donald Trump uh, trashing the Kurdish people. 
We'll see. In the meantime, uh, our soldiers are not in harm's way, as they shouldn't be, as two countries fight over land. That has nothing to do with us. And uh, the Kurds are much safer right now, but the Kurds know how to fight. And as I said, they're not angels. They're not angels. If you take a look, you have to go back and take a look. But they fought with us. Uh, we paid a lot of money for them to fight with us, and that's okay. Uh, they did well when they fought with us. They didn't do so well when they didn't fight with us. Uh, when I refused to allow the Americans a year and a half ago to fight with the Kurds against Iraq, I said, wait a minute. This country stupidly just spent a fortune on fighting for, with, around Iraq. Nobody knows how they spent it. But they spent, actually, we're in the Middle East now for $8 trillion, if you can believe that stupidity. But in Iraq, we're in for probably five and a half trillion. So they're telling me, wait a minute, we just spent five and a half trillion fighting in Iraq and with Iraq. And now we're supposed to spend money to fight with the Kurds against Iraq. I said, no, thank you. No, I believe he's talking. I mean, I, I actually don't know exactly what the hell he's talking about. Either he maybe he's talking about the Kurdish referendum in northern Iraq. Um, obviously, uh, the Kurds had uh, were trying to gain independence formally, even though they have a very autonomous region in northern Iraq. That is a different political faction than the ones in northern Syria. Just so you know. Just so you know. It's crazy. It's crazy. But if you look at the history, there's a lot going on. Today's show is brought to you by Karayuma, Mar- which Mary, uh, Kar- Karayuma, sorry. Today's show is brought to you by Karayuma. Karayuma marries old school designs with new school ethics. They want the shoes you wear to be made responsibly, feel crazy comfortable, and provide effortless style. That's why they made their sneakers by hand with premium natural materials. Like their uh, canvas, which is made from cotton sourced via fair trade initiatives, or their cleaner premium leather, which is made with water that's been reused and treated with zero chemical waste output. Their outsole is even made out of raw natural rubber. Plus their shipping footprint balance is zero, which is amazing considering they ship worldwide and here in the U.S., they even have express shipping and can deliver you shoes in just two to three business days. Then if there are any issues and they don't fit perfectly, you can return them free of charge. These are incredibly good-looking shoes. I've really noticed that because as Sam has begun to wear them, I don't feel embarrassed looking at Sam's feet. I feel proud. Dope shoes for Sam. For a limited time, our listeners can get 15% off of their first pair of Karayuma sneakers. Go to C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash majority. That's Karayuma dot com slash majority for 15% off today. And the language wars are going to be heating up around here soon. Babbel will get you speaking a new language quickly and with confidence. Choose from 14 languages, including French, Spanish, Italian, but what else we got? I think there's also Port. I know there's Portuguese. Uh, what else? The Turkish. Plenty of uh, fascinating options there. Babbel's teaching method and speech recognition technology has proven to be effective across multiple studies. Babbel's lessons are lovingly created by over 100 language experts, aka real people, not by a translation machine. Lessons are engaging and convenient, lasting only 10 to 15 minutes. Learn through interactive dialogue so you can perfect your pronunciation and accent. Babbel is available as an app or online, and your progress syncs across all devices. I am extraordinarily excited to, I'm actually going to do this to learn Portuguese. And I have like language learning phobias. And looking at the platform and how easy it is to use. This it's is like Brazilian the first... Portuguese, too, specifically. Oh, man, I got to do this. I've gotten a sense. I looked a little bit at the app to just try to, like, get over my fear of doing it. And it looks incredibly inviting and fun. Because you listen to this show, Babbel has a special offer for you. Go to Babbel.com and select the language of your choice, Brazilian Portuguese for me. Once you try for free and are ready to sign up, select the three-month option and Babbel will give you three additional months for free with promo code MAJORITY. That's six months for the cost of three with promo code MAJORITY. 
Go to Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Enter promo code MAJORITY. Babbel, speak a new language with confidence. And finally, one of today's, our, our last sponsor of the day is BetterHelp, who is giving our audience 10% off their first month when they go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. BetterHelp gives you access to your own fully licensed and accredited therapist via phone, chat, or video. When you sign up, they'll match you with a therapist based on your specific needs, and you'll be communicating with that therapist in less than 24 hours. If you're not happy with your therapist, you can switch to a new one at any time for any reason for no additional charge. They have 3,000 licensed therapists from all over the country. So they have therapists with specialties that may not be available in your area. You don't have to drive to an office, sit around in a waiting room. You can do everything from the comfort of your own home. BetterHelp tends to be more affordable than traditional in-person therapy, and they have financial aid options if you qualify. They're giving everyone in our audience 10% off of our first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash majority report. We're going to take a brief break and we will be right back with Matt Carp. on social media seem to parse out MLK's words for whatever narrative they're currently pushing in our modern times. Ten thousand bucks. Ten thousand dollar bet. It is very, very disturbing when I hear the millionaire or billionaire word. And I told them to stop it, knock it off. Infrastructure, no bumps in the road. What is your opinion on Brazilian Prime Minister uh, Paul Sarnero? Uh, uh, regarding oops, there's a lot of things moving here. Deforestation of the rainforest. Yes, I'm a Christian. I bake you a cake, though. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about him, um, but it sounds like he really hates Marxism and, and he's really pushing Brazil to become more of a world leader and that he actually is for capitalism and he's trying to get some of the SJW stuff out of the schools. I just saw a tweet by him a day or two ago. So on that front, and I, I, again, I don't know a ton about him. That all sounds good to me. Um, see people's feedback loops in a You see people's feedback loops in a Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here. Joining us now is Matt Karp. He's an assistant professor of history at Princeton University. He's also the czar and ideological director of the Jacobin magazine, or also known to the public as contributing editor. And he is the author of, is this the future liberals want a brilliant piece that just came out in Jacobin? Matt professor. Thanks for being here. Actually. Uh, sorry. Um, as, as a step one of my professional class credentialism, I'm going to have to insist on being called the, uh, referred to as an associate professor because I did get tenure and, uh, that's, of minor significance in this, in this conversation. Well, I, I don't know actually how minor it is. I've, I've noticed some people, uh, kind of zero in with a lot of, uh, there's one Vox writer that was giving you a lot of, uh, but yet you drive cars arguments about your piece. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, let's not lead with him. Let's definitely not lead with him. And let's actually talk about the, uh, the nice and smart one as well. Um, the one at New York magazine, but before we get to all of that, let's, uh, um, uh, talk about, uh, actually really get bigger, uh, picture in terms of the contextualizing your piece. Let's talk about yeah. the modern history of the democratic party, the new deal coalition, 
what happened in the 1970s through the rise of Third Way and where we are today. Give us that broader I, social history, if you can. Yeah, and I think I gotta, I'm got i going to go a little uh, international with it, too, because, I mean, I Please. think this is a sort of a basic – you know, um, kind of a historical fundamental about modern societies in the kind of, you know, industrialized or post-industrialized world that, um, you know, basically somehow sort of escapes 99% of our discourse. But I mean, like, what were the political forces that the, that basically built the basic infrastructure of social democracy or the welfare state or um, however you want to call it uh, in the United States, in Europe, you know, everywhere across the Atlantic world, what built the national Health Service in Britain, what uh, created unemployment insurance, free college in Scandinavia and elsewhere, family leave policy, and in the U.S., where our our welfare state is much more patchwork. Um, what what produced even the things that we do have, Social Security, Medicare, et cetera? In, in every case, organized labor and labor struggles were crucial, central to these movements. But they were also, as sort of a matter of the record, although we don't talk about this very much, um, produced by political parties that were dominated uh, by the working class. That that in in whom the working class in European cases were sort of formally at the center of socialist and social democratic and labor parties. But even in the United States, in the, the Democratic Party of the New Deal era, overwhelmingly as a coalition um, from you know black workers in Harlem uh, who switched to the Democratic Party under FDR through to rural farm workers in, in, in say, New Mexico or uh, industrial workers in Chicago or, or Cleveland. Um, you know, this is a party of work that was dominated by working people. And we don't need to be nostalgic about this mid-century era, but – the de- it, that that's what made the the New Deal itself, and including I think the the, the achievements of the civil rights movement uh, of the you know from the 50s into the 60s was that the Democratic Party was a party of workers, uh, was a party which had a close relationship to the labor movement, and whose main voters, whose key constituents were workers, and you know that alignment is gone now, uh, and it's been gone for a long time, and I think you know it's one of the main you know things that the left or progressives or uh, uh, anyone who's trying to sort of make a big structural change in this country has to grapple with the passing of that alignment um, that, that actually produced the fundamentals, uh, you know, in our society. Yeah, and you make the point um, that even a politician who, you know, frankly, uh, you know, pretty mediocre in many respects and one that ended up uh, embracing the, you know, the genocide in Vietnam. And I think one of the, actually the ironies is that part of the limits – to these political projects that delivered so many gains in the United States and Europe is is the international dimension, which actually has some mm-hmm. echoes today. And then the other dimension, of course, is the uh, is the broader civil rights and equity dimension, which also ex- has echoes today. But, you know, a guy like Hubert Humphrey um, – arising from this working class base was actually number one was actually quite uh, – he deserves real credit in terms of uh, civil rights work, in terms of especially actual political risk in the beginning of his mm-hmm. career. And then uh, even through the 60s, even as he becomes the you know subservient vice president to LBJ, embraces the genocide in Vietnam, this is still a guy who's talking about uh, you know free college, labor policies, health care, an extraordinarily progressive baseline – and that, as you say, is not the product of particular qualities of leadership. It's the class configuration. Exactly. Exactly. I think we still we tend to have this um, view, and I think it's partly inculcated by 50 years of of having lost this class, you know, configuration. That you know, political parties or even movements within parties, and and frankly, this is this remains an issue, you know, with the Sanders movement that I obviously think is our you know our only hope at this point, but um, that identifies kind of you know um, progress or possibility with individual leaders or char- or the character of certain politicians. You know, whether that's, uh, you know, whether that's somebody like Barack Obama or somebody uh, uh, or somebody like, you know, Elizabeth Warren, whatever, um, that we need somebody who thinks this way. But the whole point about what Herbert Humphrey, what Hubert Humphrey and sorry, I'm very sorry, Mr. Humphrey, uh, <laughs> what uh, Hubert Humphrey represented was that it, it, it wasn't I mean, he did. He, he like all politicians had individual personal qualities. But uh, what made uh, the Democratic.
Democratic Party possible, what made the achievements, the limited but still real achievements of the New Deal era possible was that this was the baseline, and it wasn't about the politicians. Any old hack was going to support uh, was going to support a national health care system. You know, even if they couldn't get it through, the Democratic Party hacks voted for it. Right. You know, um, this was this was this was. I think I liked your word. This was the baseline, and we don't have anything like that baseline. We have to build that baseline again. But um, we'll get to that. I guess. How does that come apart? So, in one part of the story, obviously, and this, I think, you know, this is a very important part. But this is a part that, well, you see it in the Democratic Party, certainly with the, certainly the racial politics that people in the Third Way and Bill Clinton embraced in the eighties and nineties, which mm-hmm. really, you know, they didn't go as far as Reagan, but they were quite comfortable making very racist and xenophobic appeals. So people know that certainly, you know, the rise of Nixon. And part of the breakup of the New Deal coalition is definitely a, you know, a, a, you know, apartheid is being Jim Crow is being formally dismantled in the United States. It's, of course, still actually existing in many respects, but it is being legally dismantled. And then there is a, uh, you know, there is absolutely a strong racial backlash amongst uh, a significant portion of white voters. Then the other parallel Though is that we mm-hmm. see, uh, and and you know this is just and this is more relevant for understanding the current dynamics of the Democratic Party, is a rise of a, a professional class and a highly educated baby boomer generation coming out of the '60s who uh, might even be really correct and highly socially progressive on civil rights and women's rights and correct on Vietnam, but have no conception of class, maybe even are reactive and condescending and snotty towards labor politics. And then also, you know, a rise of, I mean, you know, as an example, Adolph Reed talks about, you know, the historical breakthrough of an African-American mayor in Atlanta in uh, the 70s, and then who also goes on to proceed to lay off 2,000 primarily uh, African-American public workers with devastating effect on, you know, an emergent black middle class in the South, right? So those two trends start to coalesce, and then we start to get the the origins of the Democratic Party of Chuck Schumer saying, you know, for every blue collar vote we lose, uh, you know, in in Michigan, I think it was, we pick up an affluent suburbanite in uh, in the suburbs of Philly. Yeah, exactly. I mean that 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 is the culmination. That Schumer uh, quote, which I think is echoed by Ed Rendell and you know half a dozen other uh, other of these of these figures, is is the culmination of this you know half century of you know m- much larger um, political, economic, social transformation that you know is not unique to the United States either. Um, you know the 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 broader factors that you know America has a has a particular narrative, and I think the the, the narrative about um, civil rights, which I do include. I think, yep. and I think uh, a lot of the latest scholarship includes this as, as a as a real achievement in some ways of this working class labor driven uh, class configuration in the mid century. You know, there's a reason why um, you know nothing like the civil rights movement was possible in the Gilded Age without kind of anything like class voting. But leaving that aside, the backlash to civil rights very important uh, as you as you as you uh, sorry as you have laid out there in terms of transforming um, the voter bases. But you know, you don't actually need the racial backlash theory to explain this because it's been happening in other countries that didn't have um, didn't have the same racial politics uh, as the United States. I mean, it's happened everywhere in Western Europe where um, parties of the left, traditional working class parties, uh, with the with the rise of globalization, financialization, uh, automation, um, etc., uh, uh, and the sort of arrival of new of the knowledge economy and new professional class, uh, um, you know, new professional class constituencies have gradually sort of moved away from a working class base. Ideologically, they've moved away, uh, and, and decisions to move right on, 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 on economic questions, on free trade, uh, on, uh, on, on union politics that you know, are not unique to the United States. Obviously, you had the Third Way in Britain and Tony Blair and everywhere else. Anyway, um, these, the, the mixture of both larger, a larger restructuring of the world economy you know, in the 19th, after, since, since the 1960s, 
1970s, and the sort of this, the the maneuvers of these center left parties away from a working class base has really accelerated this transformation. Where you now have, yeah, from the party of of, uh, of Hubert Humphrey, uh, where I think I think Chuck Schumer is a nice analog. He's he's neither the best nor the worst of this new breed. He's just perfectly average as a representative just of an it. You know, absolute hack. Out, yes. Absolute. Straight out of Harvard Law, right into the right. legislature, and kind of followed the trajectory of this kind of professional class politics all the way down uh, in terms of his connections on Wall Street, uh, in the you know which he built up in the 80s and 90s, uh, and his kind of you know you know he's not even the most right wing Democrat. In some ways, the argument of the piece is not so much that um, this uh, that that swapping out blue collar workers for white collar uh, you know college educated, often affluent voters. It's not. It doesn't necessarily have an ideological cast that has to move things to the right. You know, that did happen in the 80s with the New Democrats. That that was Dukakis and Clinton's political project. But it can also, you know, come under the mantle of a kind of progressivism. I mean, the first, the, the, the first wave of this process that you see, I think, uh, you know, if you look at voting returns, is in the McGovern campaign of 1972, uh, 1972 which is admirable in lots of ways, um, certainly on its, in its rejection of the kind of, of, you know, the atrocities of the Cold War. War and Vietnam, but um, but also represented an, a conscious effort on, on the part of some of these kind of college-educated early boomers that you describe to kind of move away from a working-class alignment and towards uh, you know a coalition of the educated and the dedicated. You know, basically people who had the right values rather than people whose material interests were aligned. And, right. And that's um, again, a... they didn't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You come in. Yeah. No. <laughs> I just no. I just want yeah. to really underline that because I think yeah that is. I mean, one, and it should be noted, I mean, there's a lot to admire George McGovern for, but he he was, and partially, I guess, you know, because to, to be fair to him, he dealt with maybe some, um, you know, problematic union politics. However, it, it was inexcusable. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a virulent fighter against unions. He literally, in the beginning of the Obama administration, recorded a propaganda ad against card check. I mean, so his actual broader labor politics. I didn't know that. Are, yeah, it's, huh. it's a mark against his career. He was not good on a number of labor, you know, issues. It did not match with the rest of his progressivism, which obviously was quite noble and correct in many areas. But that flip, though, and it's going to take us, because I want you to get us to today and explain the Patagonia road to socialism. But that flip, and of course, you know, look, it's always base, it's always superstructure, if people will indulge me for a minute. Of course, values matter. Of course, people at the end, of of course, there's moral calculations in politics. And of course, you know, look, something as exalted as, you know, you want to have a globe that works well for workers everywhere, east, west, north, south, is obviously a moral commitment. However, there is also a base understanding of politics that also says, it, things fundamentally revolve around power and resources, and we should be working diligently and in conflict to deliver power and resources to the vast majority of human beings so they're not gobbled mm-hmm. up by a few, and that that actually is a question literally of, say, just labor versus capital as an example, that politics is not a broader abstract field of persuasion and ideas and immaterial trends. And I think that is where... You actually really can, if you understand those terms, politicians as different as George McGovern, Bill Clinton, uh, Michael Dukakis, Tony Blair, Barack Obama, and Elizabeth Warren fit in that tradition as distinct from a Bernie Sanders who really does look at things in class and power terms. So that, just setting that up to get to the Patagonia road to socialism and how this distinction is playing out today. Yeah, I mean, so th- I mean, this is where we can bring in our um, our friends at uh, at Vox and NY Mag, which are, I guess the same thing. I guess it's I don't know what it is. It's just going to be called Knox or something like that. Um, uh, I do want to emphasize there is an called- actual friend at NY Magazine and uh, Vox. I-, I don't care about that guy. 
Yeah. Okay. That's true. No, I like. I I feel the same way. Yes. Um, and I and I and in some ways I probably did a little bit of an injustice to uh, Eric Levitz by lumping him in with Matt Iglesias here, and uh, I I apologize for that to an extent. But I think the the point is, um, you know, Levitz, I'll, and we'll just start with him because I think he's a more serious, um, uh, you know, um, I wouldn't say antagonist, but he's a more serious discussion partner here. Um, you know, have have made the case basically that this doesn't that you know even though this is worrying in a kind of conceptual sense. Um, in fact, in this current moment, um, the truth is that, uh, you know, affluent liberals who are now the, the college educated suburbanites who Chuck Schumer wanted to bring into the party actually also not only will come into the party, but will support significant progressive reform, you know, and that in that sense, including economic reform, because it, it, the argument goes, um, and it's not entirely wrong, that the that actually the real gains, the trend, the way that the the American economy, the world economy too, but the American economy in particular has been um, twisted and distorted in the last 50 years, is that it's actually not the professional class that have prospered. It's not even you know it's even the affluent professional class isn't doing the top 10% isn't isn't actually reaping the benefits in the way that the top 1% can. So uh, in in this sense, uh, you know, the argument goes that. Democrats don't need to worry too much, at least, about this shifting class coalition, which is actually accelerating. You know, this is the point. It's not an ideological thing. Um, you know, Obama was ideologically to the left of Clinton or Dukakis, no question about it. But yep. that that ideological difference did, do, did, did nothing to transform this kind of ongoing class shift, which actually increased in the 2000s. Uh, and, and, and my perspective, Warren, who's now to the left of Obama, that's wonderful. She also is not going to do anything to transform. To, to sort of alter the tide of this movement. Anyway, these guys think Levitz argues that this is not going to that 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 Obamaism, in effect, and Warrenism can actually still achieve significant reforms because these you know relatively affluent professional class new Democrats will are on board for something like Medicare for all, et cetera. And I I have um, a lot of skepticism about that based on um, you know and he uses mostly polling data to to support this, but I think the actual record of Democrats in power, whether it's in the Obama administration or even at the state level more recently, um, suggests that there are some really fixed limits to uh, the kind of struggle that these that this new breed of Democrats is able uh, is, 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 you know, how much iron is in their blood when it comes to fighting for this stuff, because their constituency doesn't actually need it in the same direct material way um, that a working class constituency would need. And so if you look at, you know, on the state level, all sorts of Democrats have, you know, totally swept and dominated these blue state legislatures, but they're not actually doing anything like uh, serious economic redistribution. In fact, the first thing they're doing when they get into power is ruling out tax increases, even in ultra blue progressive states like Washington state, say, um, you know, this is, this is off the table. Uh, and, and, you know, if you look at the Obama administration, same thing. I know, I know we can talk about Obama and Warren, but I mean, Obama had a lot of progressive plans and platforms yep. um, that mm -hmm. in theory, uh, a lot of these professionals might, might have supported and, and, and in theory might even have benefited from. But he didn't fight for any of them, really. In particular, you know, the Card Check Employee Free Choice Act is a, is a sort of sh shining example of this. And is that because Obama himself was actually totally ne neoliberal and hated unions? I don't know. I'm agnostic on that. I think the truth is it, – it, the real truth was that the Democratic Party didn't have – it wasn't part of the, the party's baseline anymore. It was part of the baseline rhetoric, but it wasn't part of what the party actually stood for as a party. And I worry that even no matter how grand our plans and schemes are, if the party continues in this direction as a coalition, as a, as a, in, in its material underpinnings, um, we get even further away from that baseline. Yeah, so this is where – and I think actually the comparison of Warren to Obama is so much more illustrative, um, including even on the trend line of, you know, okay, we keep, you know, Obama's to the left of Clinton, Warren's to the left of Obama, but we still have this fundamental dynamic of, of uh, class identification and really how this translates practically, again, is the difference. Um, and some people think it's petty, but actually it's fundamental to any way of understanding how we do politics of do we have an organizer in chief who has a bottom up pressure strategy or do we have you know ultra charismatic or you know ultra brilliant or whatever you know people's preferred adjective person helming it who usually has a special academic ability and somehow will be able to kind of adjust the bureaucracy so what 
you know, what does this tell you in terms of the overwhelming wealth gap in the support uh, for Warren? And then the fact yeah. that, you know, and, and maybe also just a liber- elaborate on the first part, right? I want to quote briefly from you, just, just going back a second. Yeah. Even Levitz notes that uh, the Democratic Party has moved dramatically leftward. Why else would the Center for American Progress now propose a federal job guarantee and universal health care? And I like this part because, you know, the timelines get so short here and we need to be a bit more historical. Why now, indeed, inequality yawned just as grotesquely 10 years ago under the presidency of Barack Obama and a filibuster proof Senate when the Senate Center for American Progress supported no such things. Now, getting back to the beginning part of the conversation is there's one theory that, you know, well, the Piketty book came out and. You know, there's different conversations going on in brownstones and suburban homes and the kind of intellectual culture. Yeah, the discourse is shifting. Or it's the relentless onslaught that has been taking place for decades that first, of course, was felt most disproportionately uh, and most aggressively in the peripheries, in the inner cities and racialized ways in Appalachia and rural areas, and then gets pushed and pushed more in so that you can, you know, just I'll be Thomas Friedman for a second. You can jump into an Uber and talk to somebody and they're like, oh, yeah, actually, you know, I was making a really good living in, you know, tech 15 years ago or something. And basically I haven't had a proper job in over a decade and my savings are done, uh, you know, and I'm driving an Uber and I and, you know, plenty of markers of privilege. And I did all of the quote unquote right things and the economy doesn't work for me that Bernie Sanders and other adjacent social movements came along and said, we just need to raise the baseline, stop the bullshit and put a social democratic platform that people are actually fighting for him, which is why his lead donators are employees at Amazon, Walmart and teachers, that it was a material force, not an ideation um, as the what shifted the game. Yeah, no, exactly. And and so some of it does come down to your reading of the history of the last 10 years. Absolutely. Right. I mean, because I mean, at one starting point, I think, which I, I, I think to a certain extent, even, you know, sort of good faith left liberal critics don't always appreciate uh, fully or reckon with is the extent to which, you know, uh, you know, stuff is getting worse, to put it very nicely. You know, I mean, 80 percent right. of American workers, right, are living paycheck to paycheck. Right. You know, even as, you know, American Corporations in 2018 had something almost two two trillion dollars in corporate profit. It's doubled as a, as a as a percentage of the GDP. Right? This is getting worse. This this is all post Obama. This is not Trump didn't do this. Right? And uh, you know, if, if anything, as as uh, you know, we both argued this produced Trump. So so how do we address this? You know, I think I think you're right that um, there. I think I th- actually I think those narratives are not intention. You know that there are different conversations being had in brownstones, sure, and that's sure. why Warren's call for big structural change is something that actually you know the brownstones are getting behind. But the question is, what kind of coalition can actually deliver or begin to deliver um, this new baseline that we're talking about? For me, what's actually what's moved the needle in a material way, and if you look at the timeline pretty precisely, I mean, if you really want to parse the last few years, I mean, even in the 2015, which is, you know, right at the end of the Obama presidency, you know, right, right before the hurricane, um, you know, nobody was talking about any of this stuff. Um, this was not, uh, you know, so, some, something like single payer health care was like not on the agenda in any significant way. I think the New York Times like spent all year basically without talking about Medicare for all, even though they had been talking about it, you know, years and years before during the health policy issue. And it was in a significant extent, the Sanders campaign, not because of he was like a sort of a lone progressive hero, but because he kind of articulated these baseline demands and thrust them kind of by, by you know, by sheer force into, into this conversation that, you know, has, has unleashed all sorts of or revealed all sorts of discontented energies all the way down. And I think this, that, that has produced his one million donors, right, his truck drivers and his, you know, and his bartender donors who are, you know, who are, who are, who are you know, pushing this movement. And it's these demands that have caused, I think, a lot of the official liberals to sort of backpedal. And now they're in a situation where, I mean, the paradox is for somebody like Warren um, and even for, you know, even Warren's kind of centrist opponents, you know, Medicare for all is incredibly popular. So actually, even, you know, it's now it's now the thing that everybody and every Democratic voter wants. So you can't actually oppose it. Um, And that's because that's down to 
the pressure that Bernie Sanders and a movement that, that did not originate in the brownstones uh, has, has, has applied. So the question going forward is, do we want to continue with uh, that kind of movement that is bringing – Large, large and increasing elements of social pressure on the system, or do we hand over the keys to the best person within the system who's going to you know, you know, redesign the architecture of the system somehow, um, kind of without anything like that movement, and in fact with uh, mostly buoyed by, most enthusiastically buoyed by the support of, um, of, 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 of the professional class. I mean, you know, we can read the polling cross tabs in a lot of different ways, and it's not the case, obviously, that Sanders is, you know, single, you know, every Every single one of his supporters is some kind of, you know, front, you know, is, is like a line worker, a GM, or something like that. And every one of Warren's is a is a professor of astrophysics. But um, but the truth is, to the extent that there is anything like a working class driven, working class led movement, not just in the who you passively support in a in a kind of a, a poll cross tab, but who you donate to, who you volunteer for, who you're who you're energized to enter politics for, like someone like a, uh, the bartender, the most famous bartender in America, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right. you know, that, that, that movement is all in the Sanders camp. I mean, for me, I don't see anything Definitely. like that in the Warren camp. In fact, I see anything, I see it, it, the inverse. Yeah. So then what, and so then that goes back to then, well, you know, two, two things that seem to always crop up in this debate. And one is funny because one, they always say, well, Bernie will face barriers too. And that's, I I mean, that's a bizarre because it's like, yeah, of course, in fact, he'll face even more barriers because he has even more targets. He's literally trying to take on capital as a structure, not even just discrete abuses within capital. Uh, And two, the argument is that the only way. So, you know, that's the paradox. Yeah. Warren's put some very good ideas on the table. And by the way, even, you know, but even like Joe Biden's self care plan would get killed by the industry today if he actually fought for it, which obviously we all doubt. So the, right. the, the question is, is, you know, even if you put on a much more modest, limited plan than the full structure plan that Sanders has on offer for real no BS health care, real no BS complete medical and student debt relief, you know, a serious Green New Deal labor power. I mean, the, you know, he's put forward a structure that's unparalleled in modern politics, but even something that's way more limited than that would still require the thing that he has assembled. And that, I think, is where, you know, and and the kind of tragedy of Obama, because Obama actually did assemble something analogous, but it was built on a kind of feeling and a brand and an ethos, not a policy set. So when you say, is this the future liberals want, can you get really specific into like, how you see those two choices playing out in terms of the way that underlines the stakes of the difference here? Yeah, totally. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for one thing is we, we we get so, and I don't I don't I don't think this is an entirely you know I, I think it's understandable, but I think our horizons, especially around elections, get so shortened and so narrow that it's like okay, well, what is X going to do in office? What is X? How are they? How are you going to get by? You know, uh, how are you going to get by Congress? How are you? You know, are you? Is Bernie going to abolish the fil- filibuster? It's like it's all about like uh, immediately assuming that what 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 the entire premise of a campaign is like how much legislation it can pass in the first hundred days. Now, that's really important. And absolutely, that is to the extent to, to a significant extent how, um, you know, larger structural changes happen. Ultimately, it does have to come through uh, a legislative barrage. There's no question that um, that's on the horizon somehow. But clearly, in our current configuration, neither neither Bernie nor Warren nor Biden nor I actually can't imagine any of these other people becoming president um, will uh, will be able to do that because of these structural constraints. So the issue is you have to start to think a little bit beyond just the next, you know, beyond March 2021 and start thinking a little bit about what is the future of politics going to look like over the next, say, 10, 20 years even. I'm not trying to go further than that. I mean, and we've got, uh, obviously, as we've just, as, as you know, you've talked about many times, a pretty existential ticking clock here. So we can't push this down the road forever, but we have to think about, uh, in terms of the climate crisis, but we have to think about what we can do to get to the much more radical and much more transformative um, you know, baseline that we need. And for me, the risk with uh, well, I'll start with the war in future. The risk with doubling down on that kind of, you know, on on that kind of politics that accelerates, and I think this it it, it would, the, you know, partly for reasons of of, of of style and performance, which I think are significant here. Uh, a Warren 
and Trump campaign would really highlight. Um, I, I mean, you know, people can disagree that Warren can come out and out populist Trump. I mean, I would love to see that, but I think um, the, the 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 all the indications are so far that it would you would have another kind of deranged right wing populist campaign against the kind of sober, planful liberal. Right. Um, you totally. know, where the ideological differences are actually submerged, not uh, heightened. And, 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 and with a coalition like that, you know, you end up creating a situation where the Democrats become, you know, you, you, what Warren say wins or Warren loses, and you have one day Warren, then you have Buttigieg coming up next, because people who support Buttigieg are actually have a similar cast as people who su- support Warren, you right. know, materially. And, and, and there's sort of no basis that that wheel, material base to believe that that wheel is not going to keep spinning uh, around and around and around. Whereas Sanders, look, we shouldn't be doe-eyed about this. Huge obstacles, and not just obstacles in terms of the Republican Party or the Democrats or indus- or you know, establishment Democrats or industry. There are huge obstacles in terms of organizing and building a working class movement in our atomized, individualized yep. kind of um, you know uh, you know d- you know sort of decomposed you know class society. But but there are signs of hope there. There are signs that uh, in, the, in the polls, yes, but also in the donors, in the, in the volunteers, in the energy, in the people who have thrown themselves into politics. And I think if you think about how that would look over the next, uh, not just during a, a Sanders administration, would, would obviously heighten and accelerate that, that kind of politicization that is really what we need to sort of mobilize, not just uh, not just a you know a frustrated you know a professor or lawyer or doctor, but to mobilize you know the bartenders and the uh, and the and you know and the and the and the drivers and the uh, you know industrial workers that we and need. and the, and, and, uh, and having yeah. leaders also emerge. I mean, you know, the best yep. president of the 21st century is Lula. I'm so you know without a doubt, yep. 40 million people people out of yeah. poverty. That's a worker who never went to college, who was illiterate until he was yeah. a teenager. And he's, you know, we need to draw. And, and as you say, I mean, AOC is a bartender. It's amazing. And it's also incredible. I love Republicans who on once, you know, they do their, their endless whining about, you know, liberal elites and then attack her for having a job, right? Like how yeah. effective is that just even as a metric that it shows their snobby, their snobbery. But as a final point, I just think it's, to me, it's really starting to come down to it's is it a politics that says we reconcile these historical contradictions, but we still recognize that any type of durable, just solution oriented society has to come from a bottom up base rooted in working and material conditions versus do we keep sitting on the outside and read like the article and hope, you know, do we want like the good person on the Harvard Law Review or the bad person? And, you know, what's so bizarre is that really that's right. what politics has been reduced to. And then you look and, of course, you know, within that context, you know, Warren is is good. Uh, you know, uh, John Roberts is a villain. Pete Buttigieg is a cipher. Uh, but the truth is, is they're all friends to some extent. They all share a framework and we're on the outside looking in, hoping for redemption versus realizing that we have to do it ourselves. And Bernie absolutely understands that. And it is reflected in the campaign. Yeah, that's, that's like supremely well said. I think, uh, I think, I mean, I think the only thing that I would add on that is that, you know, when you talk about Bernie as organizer in chief, a lot of this work has to be done outside of electoral politics too, right? As Mm -hmm. we say. And so what we're talking about here, it's a, it is a little bit of a moonshot. I mean, there's no question about it. It's kind of an attempt to sort of use electoral politics to do things that are not just electoral. But, uh, but I think, uh, but I think, you know, you can see, you know, uh, in the way in which Bernie activists and Bernie volunteers were instrumental in forging uh, the red state revolt among teacher strikes in West Virginia and Arizona, you can see like actual like real evidence that this movement, even though right now it is electoral, uh, and and certainly that has to be a focus uh, for in terms of electing Bernie Sanders, and will, can never be completely backburnered. But it's an attempt to kind of forge results and and movements that are not uh, entirely themselves electoral. So yes, we want more working class people to run for office, and we want more. Uh, uh, and we, you know, we want more working class involvement in campaigns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we also need um, this kind of, this, fundamentally, this labor revival, driven by not by kind of, you know, um, cautious bureaucrats or, um, or, or, you know, um, you know, sort of 
uh, you know, I don't know, hesitant managers of of of, of a of a sort of decline of a labor movement in decline, but active organizers who see an ally in uh, in a powerful political movement. I mean, I think that's and that's then the, the only bureaucrats can and then the bureaucrats can come in to support that effort. I mean, you know, I, I was yes, just yes. debating that with with Ryan Grimm, and actually, it's funny because at the end of the day, he still said last night on on TMBS that it should be you know he like he's a much bigger Warren fan than me or I think you but you know he said yes it should be he wants Bernie at the top of the ticket and Warren is VP and he but he made the point that you know Justice Brandeis that is in that like anti-monopolist kind of progressive tradition that his aggressive uh, you know uh, uh, decision making from the bench still did come in the context of the rise of the American labor movement. So in some ways that even to do the job that people like Warren are putting on the table where they're constructive in terms of designing effective bureaucracies and specific policy areas, that work still hinges on the movement and the strategy that Sanders is building. So it's a second order thing. Yeah. And because yeah. ultimately, of course, you know, this is not we're not talking about some kind of like the way party work party. The American party system works is we're still talking about a two party system that is going to be a cross class coalition. That even right. at, the, at the peak of class voting and class voting polarization in, you know, say the 1930s, or 1940s, um, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't the case that no professionals or managers or any or anybody except, you know, you know, a West Virginia mine worker voted for FDR. Obviously, the whole country, you know, huge sections of the country were voting for FDR and Truman, et cetera. And I think uh, it's wrong to say that, you know, this is an attempt to sort of push out the the, the quote unquote PMC, the professional managerial class and say, uh, no, you're a class enemy. So uh, actually you just have to curl up and die somewhere. Obviously they're- um, Wow, hot take, Matt. Hot take, Professor (laughs) Carp. Hot take, oh yeah. Yeah. Exert that (laughs) and run it. Yeah. but uh, but obviously you know this is you know the the Warrens of the world I I think have a huge part to play here. The question is on what terms? You know, is it is it continue to be on the terms of yeah Harvard Law Review manages it and everybody else shows up to press a button every two years, or is it in the terms of uh, a mobilized, energized, and politicized working class is is actually starting to write its own agenda and you know its professional class allies um, can advance that agenda. I mean, that's, to me, that's obviously the superior path. 100%. And you say all that as a prison, as a uh, Princeton professor, I bet you use airplanes too, even though you talk about the climate. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, yeah, absolutely. I'm, yeah. And I breathe, I breathe uh, air that uh, is produced by uh, our declining uh, crisis ridden climate. So, right. you know, hypocrite you know, I, much. You know, complicity we yeah. we coordinated yeah. this over iPhones i love when 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 uh when conservatives and liberals use essentially unabomber arguments against socialism but at least the unabomber had the integrity to live in a cabin in montana and actually not use this stuff so, you know that's yeah, like yeah i mean to me yeah. it- <laughs> to, to be to be to be sincere for a minute, to me it, it just shows like a little bit of the the not just the intellectual bankruptcy, but just a kind of um, almost like kind of a schizophrenia on the part of people in that world who just actually can't contemplate a different kind of politics, and so sort of have to spit out a kind of you know a sort of a confused and actually you know not very systemic or thoughtful answer in response to you know even though they they prize all of those qualities you know above all um you know the the response to this kind of piece from people of that ilk has been so revealing in that sense that they you know they in a sense almost abandoning their own supposed commitments to uh to the to the rules of debate um uh it, it's very striking it is very striking uh, matt carp the pieces is, is this the future liberals want and the Jackman. Everybody should read it and share it. He's also a tenured professor, goddamn it, at Princeton University, where he teaches <laughs> history to America's uh, skull and bones. No, I'm just kidding. No, that's Yale. My bad. I'm sorry. Uh, you're you're tenured. I can make jokes like that now. No, it's the eating. Yeah. Cl- we got the eating clubs here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to get me. I want to. I want to go visit one of those one day. I want to do. I want to do a TMBS from an eating club at Princeton. <laughs> Let's make it happen. The less said, the better. Um, (laughs) I got to go go teach my class. All right, man. Thank you. All right. All right. right. Thanks, Mike. Take care. All right, folks. Uh, We are going to take a break. Go to the fun half. Become a member of the Majority Report today. Majority.fm slash become a member. What's that? 
was getting Danarchy ready, but there was oh, some other sweet. music playing. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, TMBS was last night. We did a live stream with Andre uh, Dem- uh, Demise on uh, the Canadian foreign policy and Haiti. That was great. And then we did a main show at Ryan Grimm where I went deep on the history of the World Bank, IMF, the Ecuador, and Haitian uprisings today as a result of those very same uh, corporate-led Western policies imposed on Latin America and the Caribbean. Ryan Grimm and I had a great, uh, uh, friendly debate and a big conversation about the election season, the history of the Democratic Party. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. We're almost at 3,000 patrons, which is our next goal, and uh, 100,000 subs on YouTube. Help us get there with both and snag your tickets. We're over halfway sold out, and we're still not even a month away uh, to Philly. So I, I would get those. World Cafe, November 23rd, Crystal Ball, Artesia Balthrop. And Emma Viglin. You know, the Ryan Grimm conversation plus this one are sort of the mirror images of each other in the same way that the Levitz and Virgil Texas interviews were for Sam. And between those four interviews, I feel like you, we've covered the Warren versus Sanders uh, angle uh, um, fight from every possible angle. I think that that's actually true. I think that that's totally true. Um, and I think it's time for people to... Uh, Bo for Bernie Sanders, uh, but no, I, I actually I think I think it's I think in this case, even though it's been totally destroyed as a term by the intellectual dark web, uh, you want to steel man arguments, and I certainly think I mean, Levitz and Grimm uh, have put the best on the table. Although it's interesting to me, I mean, and then Emma Viglin as well. But what's interesting to me is that at least in in Grimm and Viglin's case, I still think both their first choices are Sanders. I'm not sure where Levitz is, so it, that's interesting. Um, Matt, what's going on with Literary Hangover? I'm uh, researching the Salem Witch Trials for upcoming episodes. I uh, recently did Hobbamock and some James Fenimore Cooper. Uh, yeah, so check that out on, uh, on the, the podcast feeds and YouTube. All right, folks. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. Alpha males are back, 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 boys, back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boys, back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, I, I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break for people. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks. Fuck, fuck, mind them. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black Africans. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. black. Is all coded. Why do you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You cannot hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday!
birthday. My birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are back. Black. Africans are black. Black. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. What? What? Come on. Three. Someone needs to pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy. Total, 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 total